First of all, I'd like, I'd like to begin this by asking you to close your eyes and think of someone younger than you that you have influenced in terms of your education, uh, mentoring, uh, etc. And, and just picture them and think of them throughout this session and the other sessions over the next couple of days because, in part, what we are doing is coming up with means to improve their experiences. That's what evaluation is about. And I'm going to start off by telling you a story. This happened last week. Um, like many fathers, I'm very proud of my daughter. Um, and uh, she works um, full time for one of the major consulting companies in the world. She can't talk to me at all about what they do because it's all proprietary. But she has a, uh, a freelance job uh, in which she is, uh, on occasional weekends, in which she does the ticker for CNN. So if you've ever watched CNN broadcast, there's a little stream that goes across that gives you the latest headlines. Um, and so she's the editor for that. So millions of people see what she does when, she, when she's doing that. And, and she said, now, she often asks me questions. Like mostly math and bio questions, but, um, but in this case, she said, you know, it's not clear that we at CNN know the impact of having this ticker go across. Is it having any impact at all? We talked for half an hour about what I've learned from Pam and others about how you go about evaluating something like that. Now, that's an international scale issue because that is going out everywhere. And I, I hope that what you'll see here at this conference informs you about the variety of things that could happen at multiple scales. In that case, it's a company which has a lot more resources than perhaps we would have <laughs> for anything. But, um, but, but think about that as, as, as we go through this. So uh, I'm going to put on a different hat right now. My hat is that I am um, uh, a modeler. I use mathematical and computational approaches to address scientific issues, among other things. And I realize uh, that there's a lot that potentially could go back and forth from the research side of my life and what goes on at our National Institute between mathematics and biology and evaluation. And I haven't seen a lot published on that, so I'm, this is a little bit about it. In order to do that, I'm going to uh, need to, to point out that um, there's a connection between the evaluation process and what we would call modeling biology. So this slide was part of the webinar that we did uh, two weeks ago. Uh, and it, it's a sort of summary of the evaluation process. And the key point is that it's got some context in the, in the middle of it. And then it's got a set of data collection and, and a wide variety of other components of the evaluation process. If you haven't heard that webinar, you can go on. It's on the website and, and read it. And you'll probably see something like this uh, again. Um, this is a slide taken from the Data One site. Data One is a data network supported by the National Science Foundation, uh, and it's about the data life cycle. Notice that it has similarities uh, in the sense that it's got a plan, collect, it's got analyze, it's got the similar components to the evaluation process in it. And when I put this up, instead of just thinking about data, I often point out that this is the same kind of thing that we use for models. Um, and, I, and I've been doing models for a long time. This, this is a slide I've, I've used quite a bit because I spent 20 years of my life working on Everglades restoration. And so the context here is what's in the middle. It is the fact that uh, the Everglades are one of the most managed systems on the planet with regard to water flow. And we were coming up with ways to use computational mathematical models to help plan out what the impacts would be on a wide variety of the biota in the system uh, from uh, alternative ways of managing the system. The point here is that this modeling process is circular, that it includes components that feed back on the process itself in the same way that I like to think of evaluation as potentially done in an adaptive manner, that you are using evaluation to help you uh, uh, decide on potential ways to modify the way that you are carrying out whatever project uh, you're, you're dealing with. That's exactly what happens with, uh, with modeling as well. And I claim that you make models all the time. 
Um, so what decision do you make when you come into a store and you're there and there's all these lines at the checkout? How do you decide what to do? You can shout out and I'll, I'll repeat. Uh, what? Shortest line? You survey for the shortest line. Okay. Shortest line. What else? Least amount of groceries. What? Look for a bagger. Somebody's got a bagger there? Yeah. Okay. Anything else? Fastest cashier. So you maybe if you, you're watching and you're scanning out or you know from your history of that place whether or not somebody's fast. Anything else? Oh, self-checkout. Do you go to the self-checkout because it might indeed be quicker. All right. So all those are things. Um, any, anything else? Uh, yes. Uh, go home. That's, that's right. That's another one. Now, what, what you haven't heard is when I ask my students about this, they, uh, they say, oh, well, I just go to the line with the cutest checker. Uh, so uh, so the, the point is that, indeed, uh, you, your criteria for this, you heard a number of different ones, your criteria are different, and you made a model. Now, you didn't actually do the mathematics. There's a whole area of mathematics called queuing theory that applies to this issue. But, uh, but indeed, you made a model to make a decision. And those criteria that you chose might not be the same as a criteria for, for someone else. Now, there's lots of different objectives in doing models in, the, in a sort of similar way uh, to lots of objectives for doing an evaluation. Um, and I'm, I'm not going to read through all these. I am, I'm going to just point out one. Francois Jacob, in, uh, in, in a wonderful book in the early 80s, wrote, allows us to imagine and explore a wider range of worlds than ours, giving new perceptions and questions about how our world came to be as it is. That's one of the objectives of thinking about models. It allows you to be abstract and to throw out things and do what I call the process of selective ignorance. You selectively decide what to include and what to exclude, and that goes on in evaluation all the time. Um, and now that's not the only, uh, you know, one of the main things that when people think about models it, uh, it's to predict how a system will behave, but that's only one of many, many objectives. Okay? So these slides are all going to be posted too, so you'll be able, I'm just going to quickly go through it. Um, so this is like a five minute overview of modeling. <laughs> <That's all right>. um, <clears throat> there's no single model that can do everything, just as there's no single evaluation plan that's going to meet all possible needs. <clears throat> this is a uh, sort of <clears throat> abstract version of this from Richard Levins, that there's trade-offs between generality, precision, and realism in doing modeling, and there's trade-offs associated with any evaluation that you would do as well. There's a whole set of constraints on modeling, just as, as there are constraints on evaluation. Some of them are data. Uh, you have to think about how much data you can collect of different types. Uh, there's effort constraints. <laughs> you can't spend more money than you're basically uh, have in the budget and or your time is limited. Uh, now, there's also computational constraints in, in uh, that may not apply uh, so much in evaluation, but there are other constraints. There's ethical constraints. How many of you have dealt with IRBs? Oh, yes, okay. So you know that there's, there's all sorts of uh, issues like that. Now, <clears throat> there is this whole field of model evaluation. And there's a whole bunch, as with many fields, a whole bunch of different terminology about what different approaches to evaluation are. And there's arguments, of course, in the literature about what these terms mean. I'm not going to go through them except to point out that evaluation often involves appropriateness to the objectives, utility, is it useful, and plausibility. And uh, you know, there's this concept of elegance. And I don't, I'm not sure if there's a concept of elegance associated with evaluation. Uh, Kirk says there is, so. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, and simplicity and flexibility. Can you use the same approaches in, in other ways? Okay. So some, there's really a, a connection between this uh, and, and, and those fields. Uh, now, uh, given the many, many different potential purposes for which you're constructing a model, um, we should expect that there are lots of different criteria for evaluating models, just as there are different objectives for doing an evaluation plan and maybe different criteria by which you would uh, use to, uh, to establish whether or not that plan is effective for, it, for your objective. I would argue that developing a model in any detail, you should establish what those criteria are for accepting the model. It's not often done, uh, but uh, this 
this ties in very much to what we've heard over the last day about thinking about tying in the evaluation early in a project uh, before you've written the proposal. Um, and, um, and evaluation should account, of course, for the constraint. And evaluation of alternative approaches based on those constraints means that you're going to look at alternative ways of thinking about, um, in this case, evaluating a model, in the case of uh, some project, how you, how you do that. And that takes into account the detail and, and scale. Um, but now, there, there's a problem. In, if you look across the mathematical modeling literature, there's actually very little attention played to evaluation. Uh, why is it? Well, one is that it's difficult and it requires often a different skill set from the person developing the model. Just as in educational projects, developing an evaluation plan may require a different skill set from the people who are the education researchers or carrying out the educational project. Okay. Um, Science is very much a human enterprise, okay? And we invest a lot in what we do. And in, this is true for any education project as well. And it's, it's difficult to let someone else critique you, okay? Um, and it's also difficult to critique yourself. Um, and in modern settings, this is true for what we call team science now, that it involves often lots of people in a group. Same thing is true for many major educational projects. And um, if you're one of those individuals who says, wait, wait, we should, double, we should really think about this part of what we're doing carefully and, and think about evaluating it, you could be the outcast because, oh, wait a minute, they're slowing down this team effort. So there's a social dynamics associated with this as well. Okay. Um, so um, uh, by the way, I did publish a paper that's on some of this stuff in a modeling perspective if you're interested. Now, in, in thinking about the INCLUDES initiative, it was very clear to me from beginning to think about it, and this will look familiar because it was Barbara used something similar to this yesterday. It's the great minds thing. So, <laughs> um, so when you think about this, things operate at different scales for major initiatives that cross from the individual student to the class to, uh, to what might be called a course to the curriculum, whatever that is, to the institutional perspective of the curriculum, uh, up to whatever might be a consortium uh, or an alliance, uh, and, and then a national initiative. And thinking about this, there are different potential objectives at different scales, and there certainly are different criteria for which you would evaluate success at those different scales, too. Um, and, uh, and so that's one of the objectives of this gathering is to talk a bit about the objectives uh, at, at different scales. Now we've done this. Um, this is a quick overview of a model that spent 20 years to develop, but it's not one model. It's a collection of models operating at different scales for Everglades restoration. And the Everglades restoration cost is like, uh, it keeps changing, like $15 billion. So uh, you know, it's worth investing in some sense, and thinking very carefully at how different components of the system operate at different scales and the impact, in this case, on the biota. So this includes lots of the biological components, and down here at the bottom is the water and so on. Um, and so in, in doing this, um, I, I had some take-home lessons, okay? And I'm only going to talk about the take-home lessons from dealing with stakeholders, because we spent yesterday talking a lot about stakeholders and doing stakeholder mapping in the afternoon. So these are some of my lessons from having done what's called ATLAS. It's a cross-trophic level system simulation in which I encourage, uh, this is my line, always talk to the stakeholders and you have to do it again and again and again because they forget <laughs> often why you're doing what you're doing, okay? And, and in, the, in our case, it was being able to regularly defend what we were doing scientifically. The same thing goes, I think, for evaluation. That you have to be regularly able to say why what you're doing is really appropriate for the project and why you are the best people to help do this. Um, another set is don't limit your approach because one stakeholder, that's their emphasis, right? or funding agency in this case. Right? That there may be many, many different funding agencies involved, state level, local level, uh, national level, and, uh, and you, you, you have to be careful about being too constrained by what the objectives are for one of them. 
be prepared for criticism based upon what I call non-scientific criteria. Uh, <laughs> you have to be able to defend yourself, especially today, these days. Uh, and, and, and another thing is that if you ignore any of the stakeholders, they could stab you in the back. So it means being very careful to, to, to be in charge of, uh, in, in looking at that. Now, luckily, there are a whole set of relatively new methodologies to help us deal with things that operate at, at uh, multiple scales and deals with connections. I'm just going to show up a few slides based upon the work here at Nimbus on evaluating, uh, in this case, scientific um, uh, enterprises. So this is just a network graph of the people who have come and participated in activities in what we call working groups. Um, and they're often from biology and mathematics, but not totally. That involves people from lots of other fields, social sciences, and so on. This is just sort of a way of visualizing the kinds of connections that have arisen from these working groups between disciplines. Okay? But there's also ways to visualize, and you're not going to see this, these little circles here represent individuals, and the, the squares represent papers produced, uh, because that's one of the major outputs from a national center like this. And it's sort of a network view of the papers and the connections between different people in producing those papers. Um, and if anyone's interested in this, you're um, welcome to talk to me or, or Pam afterwards. Um, but there's also a way to think about this dynamically. And this is one of the things that's true for educational projects. They don't stay stable. In this case, it's a set of how the network connections for a particular working group changed over the three years that those, that working group operated. So I encourage you, as we think about this uh, multiple scales, to think as well about uh, essentially dynamics. Um, and I think that, that that may be a more open area in evaluation processes than it, than it is uh, in mathematics where we have you know, centuries of work on dealing with dynamic models. Um, now, uh, for the National Academies, about uh, uh, I don't know, three years ago or so, we had a little uh, gathering on thinking about what the infrastructure for life sciences would be over the next century. And I made up a set of slides that, uh, that I showed at that. And this moves from the sort of single PI investment level through to international collaboration on the horizontal axis. On the vertical axis is what I call just return on investment. There might be many metrics for that. So one way to think about this is that it's nice linear. That indeed, if you look at, for example, numbers of papers produced, uh, that that should increase as you increase investment, okay? something like that. And if you look at a later time, in other words, if you look early in a project, the number of papers produced would be lower. And then as you go through time, it's going to increase until you reach some, uh, some overall level. But it doesn't have to be linear. It might be nonlinear. It might be that there's really a change in, on return and investment at some one scale versus another. And then you might have sort of jumps. And again, if you think of this as time going on, those jumps may scale differently or, or may not scale differently as, as you change uh, and look at a project at later and later dates some sense here. Now, how does evaluation play into this? Well, I like to think of as evalu evaluation as affecting the uncertainty associated with what the return on investment is. And so, if you put in low resources on evaluation, you have a lot of uncertainty. That's what the error bars there indicate about what's going to be produced from this project. Okay? Whereas, if you invest a high amount of resources, uh, you might reduce the uncertainty in the return. Okay, uh, classic idea in economics here. Right. Um, and, uh, and, and so some sort of take homes from this. Um, so agencies, I think, uh, either independently or collaboratively can potentially invest in collaborative impact efforts at diverse scales. Right. So includes is a collaborative impact effort. Okay. Uh, and um, the m multiple impact metrics might be considered possibly dependent upon the scale. I only showed one in that axis. It was one ROI. But there might be a whole collection of them that operate at different scales. How do you combine and contrast them? And then from uh, the perspective of portfolio, how do you allocate resources across these scales is something that they may vary with the impacts. And there is, of course, a whole field of portfolio analysis that might be helpful in, in, in doing this. Um, but it means having some way of actually quantifying what the returns are. 
Um, and evaluation efforts to assess impacts might be best built in from the start. That's what we've been saying for actually all of yesterday. <laughs> um, and there is this potential for what we might call adaptive resource allocation, how you modify a project through time at different scales differentially to, uh, to consider um, um, what, uh, what the objectives are. Um, and, uh, and I would claim that these issues are particularly pertinent for something like includes because it's got a multi-scale nature. That's what that circle graph was. Uh, there's really a, a clear need for a synthesis within and across time, space, and what I call in social scales. Okay? Um, and, and of course, there's convergence of different di disciplines. 